pleasure today to introduce uh, uh, our last ERA seminar series for the 2019 <coughs> season uh, in our series titled Aesthetics, Methods of Perception. Our distinguished guest today is uh, Dr. Melissa Morrison, who will speak about the aesthetics of handwriting, scribal practice, paleography, and the art of the scribe in medieval and early modern Europe. Now, this series, and especially this final lecture, honor the scholarship of late Professor Rutherford Aris, who is a true polymath known for his work both as a chemical engineer and as a skilled classicist. He was very interested in paleography, the study of ancient writing systems, and the translation and dating of manuscripts. To that end, he published a well-known treatise called The Unfolding of Letter Forms, which concerns manuscripts dating between the first and 15th century of the current epoch. In that text, he interprets the written forms in various manuscripts in terms of the social and artistic contexts of the time. And a portion of his scholarly work as part of that treatise was conducted at the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library located at St. John's Abbey and College in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Today's speaker, Dr. Morton, is the Assistant Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library. She holds a Master's uh, in Italian Renaissance Art History, a Graduate Certificate in Book Studies from the University of Iowa, and a PhD in History from the University of Iowa. She was also a postdoctoral fellow with the Andrew Mellon Sawyer Seminar on Cultural and Textual Exchanges, the Manuscript Across Pre-Modern Eurasia. <coughs> Dr. Morton's current scholarly practice <coughs> centers on a variety of issues related to paleography, with a specific emphasis on the roles of women in the production of books in the late medieval and early Renaissance periods, and on the cross-cultural influences of those book traditions stemming from near uh, the Near East and North African cultures. Today, she'll tell us about the aesthetics of handwriting in a fitting tribute to Professor Harris. Melissa. Please. Thank you. Can we try and adjust the lights? Oh, and maybe I'm sorry. I'll, I think Honest. I should be able to see, but it'll, the, as an art historian, former art historian, uh, pictures well, well presented are really important. So yeah, I think I can, I think I can, I can make that work. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, I have a couple of microphones, so. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here and the organizers for inviting me. I've had really stimulating conversations uh, with graduate students and faculty uh, this morning and um, learned something about uh, biodegradable plastic in, 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 the, in the course of it. And also about writing systems and technology. So I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here to, to honor Rutherford Aris and feel really a particular responsibility for closing out this year's lecture series in, in, on a high note, uh, given my subject uh, was particularly close to his and being intimately involved as he was with the study of paleography. Um, I'm relatively new to Minnesota and actually to Himmel, which is what we call the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, where he did his research. Um, and sort of new to his work, so I, I've learned a great deal and what an incredible polymath he was by seeing the breadth of his work in the sciences and arts and hearing these personal stories about him from over the past months from those that knew him at, at, the, at Himmel and uh, the wider Twin Cities community too, so it's, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you. So aesthetics, as you've been exploring over the last few months, is described as a set of principles concerned with the nature and appreciation of beauty. Today I'd like to examine these principles as applied to the art of the handwritten word. Expressed in Europe in the middle, medieval, that is from around 500 to about 1500 and early modern periods, that is about 500, 1500 to 17 or 1800. Um, we'll start by talking paleography and we'll look at some handwriting from the period and discuss some of the paleographic methodologies used to analyze them, both today and in, uh, throughout history. We'll explore and challenge some basic assumptions about beauty. What makes a script beautiful? Uh, what is beautiful to us moderns? And what did medieval and early modern people think was beautiful script? And what did the scribes actually think of the scripts that they were using themselves? So paleography, the study of ancient handwriting, attempts to offer these objective guidelines for the formal visual aspects of the handwritten word. 
But even that science has its biases, as, as we'll see. At the end of my talk, I'll look very briefly at some new approaches in the field of paleography drawn from the computational sciences, which attempt to increase the objective study of scripts and writing and understand their history. So paleography, the study of the science of studying ha ancient handwriting was developed in the late 1600s along with the field of diplomatics to help identify the date and place of the production of documents, something that was very important uh, for, well, it still is important today and while uh, paleography is used today. A helpful tool for historians and philologists, so linguists who study historical scripts and historical writing, working in manuscripts. So the French Benedictine monk, Jean Mabillon, published his De Re Diplomatica in 1681, the first textbook on Latin paleography, and many others followed over the centuries, including Adriano Capelli, whose Lexicon Abbreviatorum was first published in 1912 and has remained really a standard reference for identifying a range of abbreviations used in Latin and Italian scripts. Um, for European scripts, these abbreviations are a very important part of the study of paleography since they also offer specific clues to identify provenance and date. Like you would use a certain abbreviation in France in 1490 that you wouldn't use in this part of France in 1506. So uh, contextualize our talk today, I'd like to look at a few scripts and discuss how these are thought of by scholars in, of handwriting and paleographers. So paleographers basically um, divide handwriting into two broad categories of scripts. The informal scripts, which are generally cursive scripts, is what you see here on the left. And that comes from the Latin currens, to run. So these running scripts, meant to be quickly written by scribes, um, were really the, the bread and butter of manuscript production and document production, especially in the Middle Ages and even in the early modern period. Like our modern cursive, which, don't get me started, I've already had, went on two cursive rants this morning <laughs> to unassuming faculty <laughs> at this university uh, that kids don't even learn cursive in schools these days. Did you know that? Yeah. Did, who in here learned cursive in school? Okay, you've all dated yourselves then, <laughs> because third grade is the age that you should be learning cursive, and it's the age that in a classical education and in the Middle Ages, if you were from a wealthy family, sometimes even girls, yes, at the age of eight or nine, would start their formal education in grammar and reading and writing. And that's the same age that we start cursive today, because our brains are neurologically able to start doing these complex things. Cursive, this is part of my rant, I'm just digressing, but cursive is very important. Uh, it's, it's, it's not something I think we should all do because we should be more artistic. Cursive is actually a very important way to uh, memorize material. So there's, there's hard science behind this that's neurological that explains that a person that writes cursive notes in a lecture will retain it better than somebody working on a computer. It also says that cursive, uh, that, that knitting in class or doing something else with your hands also allows you to retain and solidify information in ways that working on a computer doesn't. So part of it's about the handwork, right? Which also doesn't come from print. There's something about cursive and that the, the running script is about not lifting your pen up. So keeping that fluidity. So that's, I, I will stop ranting about cursive now, but Please, if you have kids ever, now or in the future, <laughs> and they are not allowed to learn cursive when they're in third grade, you are obliged, take a vow today, to teach them cursive, which is what, what, what I have had to do with, with children. So, very important. Okay. Um, so the pen, again, is generally not lifted up from the page since that takes time. So it's, it's something meant to be, to really get down information quickly. And it's often, because of that, not the easiest to read because of the speed at which uh, these documents were written in this cursive script. Um, but then again, I also think about, you know, we moderns aren't the audience for this. Like, um, they were produced by trained scribes and often working for government bureaucracies, courts, monasteries, centers of learning. And from ancient Roman times through the early modern period, they were meant to be read by other trained professionals. You know, like we're just like talking to ourselves because each other, because we both know how to read this thing, right? Um, 
And I've seen paleographers in the Italian archives read a completely complex script like this, like it's the newspaper. They're just like, so it's, it's part, we have a block too of thinking about, you know, perception and how we perceive things that are completely foreign to us at first glance. My first paleography teacher started us out on Roman cursive, okay? And when we balked, we are definitely not going to be able to read that. We don't even, you know, like we know Latin, but this is the class that we're learning how to read these scripts. She said, if you, will, if you start with Roman, we start with Roman cursive because if you can get this, you can read anything. And she was right, of course, as all your professors are. So sometimes uh, a document cursive would be used to make a fancier copy, like a more aesthetically appealing version, and it would be written in a formal script to be used for presentation, like to a patron or an official, a king, queen. The original could be discarded, you know, something that's written in this version, or it could be stored as a notarial copy. So in Florence, I often find like, I can find two copies of the same text. This is the presentation text, and if I look at that particular notary, I can find the original copy, so. Uh, formal scripts, they're known as book hands. They're really known as book hands, but I don't wanna complicate the use of the term hand here, so I'm gonna call them book scripts for today. Um, they take longer to write for obvious reasons. You're lifting up your pen. The letters are separated from one another. And most characters are made up of multiple pen strokes. So that just takes a lot longer and a lot more concentration and skill. Book scripts are governed by more formal, standardized rules of engagement. So characters uh, that are taught in the scriptorium, really, in, in strict uh, training centers followed by varying degrees based on the task at hand and ability of the scribe. Generally, I will say generally, <laughs> a lot of them are easier to read than most cursive scripts, so those are generalizations. Sometimes because of the popularity or ubiquity of a cursive script, it becomes a book script, because they're like, we love that, we're gonna make it formal and we're gonna like make it into something that it will be in a, in a fancier manuscript. And this happens with the Gothic cursive here. This, this just started, these aren't direct lines, I'm just showing you like it comes from a cursive script, but like the Gothic cursive that came from a documentary cursive and they decided to make it into a, a fancier script, especially for books of hours in, in 15th century France, very popular. And the same thing happens with uh, the chancery cursive. The chancery cursive becomes this thing called cancellaresca, which is chancery in Italian. <laughs> a chancery hand, chancery script, um, but it becomes a very like popular formal script that's used. So how is it that one can tell all these scripts apart? Paleographers note the general textual density often of like the overall page, like that's the first thing you can look at. I mean, you can spot a man humanist manuscript like you could that periodic table of elements across the room. Like, Ah, the textual density and the space around the page, all of those things are helpful in thinking about uh, those, those ways that paleographers are, are thinking about scripts. Angularity of the overall writing or folio, on the folio or the page. And they also then look for certain letters that carry characteristic traits when written in that script. So paleographers often pay attention to these characteristics and are even these are even sort of qualifiable in books and websites that survey historical scripts and offer paleographic training. So Himmel, the Hill Museum of Manuscript Library, that's our acronym for it. We have a whole uh, paleography series of lessons in Latin and Arabic and Syriac, which are the languages of most of, a lot of our manuscripts that are digital. Um, and anyone can go to that. I, if, I'll have, if I have time, I'll do a little tutorial at the end. But, this is just a version of these books that have been published for a really long time. This one from Eris being the one that Mahesh had mentioned at the beginning, the unfolding of letter forms from the fifth, first century to the 15th. So that's something I had the pleasure of, of looking at. We have it in the Himmel Library. Um, so really what these things do is sort of try to work on periodization of scripts and discuss often the number of pen strokes and very specific qualities of certain individual letters that give the script the flavor. Um, 
Arrow says that a script is recognizable if it possesses stable, coherent features that differentiate it from others of the same species. Stability of characteristics, coherence, harmony between different elements of display, display script, text script, and initials. So that's sort of like the different levels of, of hierarchy of script on the page. And, that, and there must be some sense of style, he says, however crude or unsophisticated it may be. So coherency is key to this uh, analysis. Harmony between the scribal elements on the page. These are things that we hear over and over again if you're looking at these paleographical manuals. A sense of style, whether or not it is aesthetically pleasing. It is like sty stylistically characteristic of that script. So the script, just to complicate things more, the script in paleographic terminology is the style of handwriting. So uh, like the 9th century Caroline Minuscule or this other thing in the 12th century, the proto-Gothic script. Um, the hand, however, refers to the instance of that script. So me as a scribe, I'm trying my best to write a really good Caroline Minuscule and I'm just trying to pay attention to my master and in the scriptorium and do it very uniformly with these coherent stylistic cat, you know, characteristics. But there'll be little things the way that I do my G uh, that are going to be a little bit different than the scribe sitting next to me. So that's how my, my hand is a manifestation of that script in using that style. Even trying to maintain that scriptorium standard for uniformity. And the reason why you have uniformity is because you have, let's say in a scriptorium, it's very rare for one scribe to complete an entire manuscript by themselves. It just takes too long, especially in monastic scriptoria. Uh, it's different, I think, in secular workshops, but in monastic scriptoria, me as a nun or a monk, I have like a certain amount of time a day because I've got to do the prayers and I've got to do work and I've got other stuff to do. So um, every, there's a bunch of people working on one manuscript. And uh, that's why uniformity is so important because we're going to all end up putting all those pages together and we want the reader to read it as if it's Oh, they're not even thinking about distracted by a change in, a, in the style, right? They're just reading it as if some, one person wrote the entire thing. So uniformity is very important in the scriptorium, which is why you end up with things like the Caroline Minuscule. But again, there are always these small stylistic idiosyncrasies that paleographers look at to indicate uh, indicator letters, sort of depending on what script the text is written in. So for the Caroline minuscule, I might look at the G. That is a G right there, the thing that looks like a three. And for the proto-Gothic script, I might look at like the clubs on the end of the L or the way the E is done particularly. So all the, all the different scripts have kind of those indicator letters that the paleographer is like very trained to zoom in on. So now, with an understanding of some of the formal elements of scripts, can we say that a certain handwriting is objectively beautiful, since we're talking about aesthetics? Uh, is it beautiful to our modern eyes? We can all agree, I think, that these handwritten letters are beautiful. Um, though, having said that, <laughs> I, I was walking by the, one of the catalogers' uh, offices earlier in the week, or I guess that was yesterday, and there's a, a, a manuscript page photographically re, uh, reproduction on his wall. And I said, look at that initial. That is gorgeous. You know, that first very flowery letter at the, he said, that is hideous. I can't believe, oh, I can't stand looking at it, you know? And so we had this funny debate about, well, that's aesthetics, right? What is our perception of beauty in letter forms? And I'm bringing something to it very specifically because those, that's actually a period that I read, I recognize as a vernacular kind of letter form. For him, his issue was like, it's illegible. You know how much time I waste trying to figure out whether that's an L or an I? You know, so legibility. This is something that keeps coming up in how we think about aesthetics, right? I mean, that in, in talking to people uh, about this. So the, the humanist minuscule, I get this a lot, like this is a very beautiful letter form. The, 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 the Gothic rotunda 
It's like the uh, artist formerly known as Prince. This is the Gothic Southern Textualis, the artist for the script formerly known as Gothic Rotunda. And um, the Gothic Bastarda, that, that script that ends up being the bookhand. Um, you know, we, we might argue that th those things are beautiful, but those perceptions do change over time. And one thing that, that I've sort of explored is, is why we moderns maybe think some particular thing is beautiful. And I, I would argue that part of why we consider these things beautiful is that our modern type fonts are actually based on a small handful of late medieval and early modern scripts mostly dating between around 1400 to 1550. So that's something to think about. You know, why is it that our modern eye maybe thinks that's beautiful? And I would love to take a survey to see how many people think that's beautiful. But um, so just to illustrate this, our Roman typeface actually comes from, so our modern Roman typeface, this is a like Garamond or a Times New Roman, it actually comes from Nicholas Jensen's Roman typeface that he developed. He's a 15th century, it's based on a 15th century humanist minuscule script that's then based on a 9th century uh, Caroline minuscule. So this is sort of early manuscript and then it's brought back. You can see the dates here. This is 9th century. It's brought back in the 15th century because of the revival of classical antiquity, which they thought that was. And then it becomes like, wow, we have the printing press and what are we going to, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. Like we're going to look around and go like, how do people write stuff? And let's make some type that looks like that. And that's how you get your Roman typeface. Uh, it's based on this hand. And it's a short step then to the proliferation of Roman uh, type fonts in the, in the digital era. And it's the same with the Gothic typeface. Uh, which were filtered through these iterations of uh, first designed by Johannes Gutenberg. So the, the Gutenberg Bible, we think of that, that's the typeface that it was printed in. So the, these first printed books used Gothic type. Romans come a little bit later. And they drew inspiration from manuscript exemplars for both their layout, those two columns with spaces, and their decorated initials. Like the whole thing was basically stolen from manuscript culture, not that I have any any grudge or anything like that. I love both manuscript and early print culture, but it's sort of like the manuscripts don't get enough credit for having inspired all this. Um, this was because it was aesthetically pleasing to readers and clients, because you know what? Like they're already familiar with it. So it's just sort of like, what are, how are, we? the early printers were the greatest entrepreneurs because it was expensive to print. The printing press and paper alone would bankrupt anyone. So they had to figure out how to sell this stuff. <laughs> and they do it by, you know, adopting basically manuscript culture and just making it replicable. You know, today these kind of modern Gothic typefaces sort of connote, I don't know, they're more formal, we use them, it's sort of goth, right? Um, I, and I would argue that legibility is happily sacrificed for the vibe that goth brings, right? Like, it's sort of like, well, we can sort of read it, but it's gothic, you know? So, uh, and you don't get that with the Romans. Like, the Romans are like, I can read that. Everyone can read that, so. The same transformation from medieval to modern took place in what we call the Italic script today. So this began as Chancery Cursive, which was one of my examples, the Cancellaressa Corsiva. And then um, it was adapted by Aldus Minucius's workshop in Venice around 1500 into an italic typeface. So uh, this is a, by the late 15th and early 16th century punch cutter, the guy that made the, the actual metal, metal type. Uh, his name was Francesco Grifo. And it was really meant at that beginning period to just print poetry. So this is a work of poetry. You can see you have Roman capitals actually. There was, it was a minuscule, script it didn't have any uppercase letters italics um, and that cursive slant and the elongation of the letter forms you know are still hallmarks of our modern day italic like we think of anything you do on your digital type you can just like well i want it italic which is overused by the way i want you all i caution you all to not overuse italic 
Uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a disease. Uh, <laughs> it should be used sparingly, uh, you know, as the great early printers did. So it's like poetry, like, yes, okay. Um, it's, and it's also, we use it to provide emphasis, right? That's something like, okay, I'm going to set it off with italic. That's like a radical act, so. Um, though we may have objective paleographic standards for how to recognize physical characteristics of script, our perceptions of beauty are quite subjective. A script that I might find very appealing or beautiful, again, you know, might be too busy, like for Phil, our cataloger, who was absolutely horrified by my love of ribbon initials, which I will show you. I love ribbon initials, okay? That's an initial that's made by a scribe by putting together a bunch of ribbon-like strips, right? And he sees those and he's like, I mean, it will take me 10 minutes to figure out that that's an E. Like, that's too much work, you know? So he's all about legibility. Now, to his credit, he's the guy we give all of the worst problem stuff to. Like, no one else can read it. Give it to Phil. He's, he's coming in, he's retired, he's got time, you know? <laughs> So I, I, you know, when he, when he brought up this legibility thing, I just laughed hysterically because I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it to you. Legibility is an issue because like your whole life is spent like ugh, trying to read cursive scripts, by the way, that are completely illegible. So to me, no end of delight. I mean, I look at them for, you know, I enjoy them. I find them beautiful. It's really, for me, part of the appeal is like the joy of discovering the letter as I look at it, which is exactly what Phil hates about it. So, um, Just to flesh this out a little bit more, I, I thought like I have a captive audience here at Himmel. There are catalogers and curators and they read all sorts of different languages and scripts and I'm like, I'm going to just take an informal survey of Himmel staff and catalogers to find out what scripts they thought were most beautiful and why. So I won't go through them all, but you can see from this array that they're all quite different. There, was, there seemed to be a preponderance of people that like this kind of stuff. I only had one guy who said he liked 12th, I love that he was like, oh, 12th century French proto-Gothic. And I'm like, that's very rare of you, you know, of course, you know. Um, because mostly what we're, you know, even, it was interesting, even the people that read this stuff, and that's the period that they study, they were like, I really love, though, like a 12th century Caroline minuscule, you know, before it gets gothic. I'm like, I can appreciate that. Okay. Um, our Arabic catalogers had great um, things. A lot of people liked this script here, and then this one also, which is characterized by these uh, horizontal lines that come down and then across, so the angularity of that. Um, you know, of course, the Armenians, I'm like, it can't just be Bologir. It's like the, the Cilician version of that is particularly appealing to me because of the blackness and the angularity. So there were a lot of um, description of like legibility was a big thing uh, for that aesthetic choice. And then, um, then also just like this artistic thing, like it's something I don't really know why I like it, but it's, it just appeals to me artistically, so. So very subjective, uniformity and legibility are key. Okay, so we might argue also that no one would say that these two scripts are beautiful. Our poor English secretary hand, this is William Shakespeare right here, Those, that's his handwriting, the, the, some, the notary wrote the rest of that. And this minuscule script, I don't know, anyone? Not get, oh, he's like, maybe, okay, maybe. Um, though, I would say, I would argue if they were legible to you, if you were that paleographer, or that scholar that read this like the newspaper, they might be quite beautiful because you would like, you would know it and have an appreciation for it. It would be aesthetically pleasing. We know the hands that we learn and we know the scripts that we learn and the work of scribes that are familiar to us are quite beautiful. So we had a question from the graduate students over lunch, like what's your favorite manuscript? You know, we think about all those beautiful illuminated things, even in the period I study, filled with gold and perfect handwriting. And I'm like, but I study nun scribes and like, 
my favorite books are the ones that they made, and they're not very attractive. They're pretty much like straightforward, no pictures, you know, not very good handwriting in many cases. But we sort of love what we know, right? We find those things beautiful. So what's beautiful to a medieval and early modern audience? The audience interacting with manuscripts in the period was quite wide, and it, if we consider even, I and I would include illiterate people in this, those with, without alphabetic literacy that saw manuscripts all around them, in the church choir, in the stationer's shop, at readings of legal documents, at public decrees in the streets. Um, this type of manuscript, you know, I would argue that they really had a level of, of, of literacy that we, we've lost. So these, these are not medieval people. But if you, if you just imagine how big that darn manuscript is, that's the kind of thing that would be on a lectern like this. And that these, these guys are probably mostly literate. But if they were lay people, um, seeing it from behind the screen here, outside of the choir, they would still be able to read that. And even if they couldn't read the language, I, I argue that people had like visual literacy. So they would know like, ooh, big book. They won't even know that's a, well, it wasn't called a Gothic rotunda at the time. <laughs> but they would recognize like the formality of that script. And they recognize the, the informality of a cursive script on this document that they see in the notary shop when they give their land to the monastery in their last will and testament. Like there's different levels of literacy, so. Um, each script has its own specific application and meaning, and these people understood that these communication technologies of their time conveyed these meanings. And differentiating traditional conventionality of formal scripts with informal cursive writing. So they likely understood all these differences and nuances between textual genres, I would argue, uh, that even if they didn't have alphabetic literacy. So scribes certainly chose the script from a variety of forms and adapted them for uses based on genre. And much of my work has been on female scribes in convent scriptoria in Renaissance Italy, so in the 15th and 16th century. And uh, nun scribes that copied thousands of books in the late Middle Ages and early modern period. Here's a sampling of the scripts that were familiar with and they were familiar with and how they applied them to different genres of writing. So, Gothic rotunda, you're never going to write a document with that. Sorry. I mean, that is used for, it's like liturgical. If I see Gothic rotunda, I'm like, it's a liturgical manuscript. So, so genre and script are related. The litera textualis, or Gothic bookhand, this type of stuff, you see in a much wider application. So these two things are related. They're both Gothic. Uh, this is much smaller. So this is the big choir books that we just looked at. Um, you see this in devotional texts, in also theological texts. Um, the litera textualis simplificata, this is the Gothic bookhand that's, that's simplified. Well, this is my Italian, this is what the Italians call it. Um, that's because this U, let's say, instead of taking one, two, three, four strokes in some of the Gothic scripts that they do, it's simplified. It's like two strokes. So they're like finding ways to make it. It's kind of cursive-y, right? Like we're going to like simplify it and make it faster. Not that they write these things any faster. It just becomes often like one of the scripts that they know. This takes less time and sometimes less skill than doing something like that. Humanist scripts you see with literary documents. So the humanists, you know, they're putting all their classical uh, and uh, writing up there, the uh, work of the ancient Romans and Greeks. And I have one nun who wrote in humanist script, and she says in her note at the end, like, I'm, she doesn't even call herself a nun. She's like, I'm the daughter of this great lord, Francesco Bernabuzzi. You know, like, listen, I grew up in a wealthy house, and I went to grammar school with my brothers, and I learned how to read and write. I learned the humanist hand, okay? Whether it's applicable to this manuscript or not, I am just telling you that. <laughs> By showing you that I can write in a, in a humanist script, okay? I'm not doing all this. I'm doing, I can do the gothic stuff if you want me to, but guess what? Boom, I can do this. That's telling me right away her level of education and learning and her breadth of like what she knows in the world in the humanist period. Italic, 
is that one that we saw already that these are really kind of two versions that chancery cursive you get with those a lot with uh, administrative documents and then the italic which is really comes from a documentary script I start to see it in devotional manuscripts in the 16th century and 17th century because that's just part of the scripts that are very popular in that period. So all of these kind of applications are, are, are very well known and they become well known also to paleographers and historians. So, so we have some indication of what the readers or recipients of the scribal texts thought about beauty. Um, and this comes from one example here of in the early 16th century from Florence. It's one of the most prolific convents of female scribes called the Marate. They're a Benedictine house and they were active in book production from like 1470s all the way through the 16th century. And one of the largest and most powerful houses of, of women, very educated, a lot of them wealthy. You know, this is where a lot of women are going with an education and money because they, their parents can't afford to marry them off. And so they get thee to a convent and they end up, you know, funneling all this artistic vocation through their work in the convent, which includes all sorts of handwork, needlework, manuscript production, everything. And what happens is, guess what? Their scriptorium was actually enlarged by Lorenzo de' Medici. Has anyone heard of Lorenzo the Magnificent? Okay, a couple of people. Um, so very great patron of the arts, like fueled Florentine, you know, the Florentine arts in the late 15th century. So, lo and behold, the new pope, Leo X, is actually a Medici. So, he lives in Rome, and he decides, I'm going to go, go visit, go, go, go home for the weekend. And I'm going to visit, you know, when he's in his papal visit to Florence, I'm going to visit all these different important places of patronage that my family has, has done before. So, they're like, oh my God, Pope Leo X is coming. And... The, the funny backstory of this is like, this book was not made for him, it's a missal. Um, they just made it and they did a great job and they had it decorated by the greatest illuminator at the time, Atavanti. And who you could, you could, if you threw a stick out the window, you'd hit a great illuminator in 15th century Florence, but they found the best one. <laughs> and when they realized he was coming to town, they're like, we're putting his coat of arms right there. So we have all this codicological evidence that like this was not actually made for Pope Leo X, but they are great entrepreneurs themselves and realize like what's our best missile? Like best scribe, let's like grab it. We're gonna put his coat of arms, it's a Medici coat of arms. He comes to town, they present him with a book and he gives them 200 scudi d'oro, golden scudi coins. And which I, based on my very bad uh, understanding of medieval currency, even at its worst, is probably like $40,000. So it's like, just here you go. So it's a gift exchange, right? The book may not be worth that, but there's that exchange going on. So that's the funny backstory. But the reason why I talk about it here is that they say in their convent chronicle, it was scritto di bellissima lettera. It was written in a beautiful script or a beautiful hand. They're telling us, we see beauty in this script. We understand what those formal characteristics are. It, it's got this full page illumination, full page borders, that the illumination is the full page board uh, there. Um, huge borders, dozens of elaborately decorated and golden illuminated initials, and then hundreds of painted initials and rubrics like, this is a painted initial, like all these things are painted. And I started counting them. It's at the, BN, uh, the National Library in Paris. And I gave up after like, I think 300 or something. I was like, well, there's a lot of them. So uh, a, a very massive production and they really saw this as, a, as you know, aesthetically pleasing, so. So what about the scribes? You know, can we get into the minds of those medieval scribes? Uh, for this, I would, I would like to turn to a modern experiment in scriptorium practice, which is the production of the St. John's Bible, which is a Bible commissioned by St. John's University. It's the only hand-lettered and illuminated Bible in the world made in the modern period. And it was made between 1998 and 2011, commissioned from Donald Jackson in Wales and his script, modern scriptorium of modern day scribes. So there were six scribes altogether, including him. 
and they worked all this out with the monks of St. John's Abbey. So though I may or may not find the book, which is massive, by the way, everybody, there's a whole St. John's Bible gallery at, at Himmel, at St. John's University in Collegeville, an hour and a half west of here, come and visit. Um, I was very intrigued to understand, wait, like I can actually see how a scriptorium might work, you know, since the, the research that I do is on scriptoria. So they, they got all these scribes together and this was, this was the, these were the ones that made the cut. There were a bunch of people that would come for like three weeks and he would like, he was the scriptorium master and he would, you know, this is the scribe that he, de the script that he developed. And um, if they did not follow it exactly, they were out. So it's a little different. You're coming in with scribal ability and you're trying to like shoehorn yourself into this one script. But it gives you, it calls to mind kind of that scriptorium practice in the Middle Ages of, of how rigorous that work was. So the idea is really, um, the thing that Donald Jackson talks about is legibility, simplicity, uniformity. It is a nod to historical scripts like, like the Caroline Minuscule and the Humanist script that we've seen. But if you look at this, four different scribes did this. They, it's a composite page. Does it look uniform to you? Yes, it should, because they had a very good scribal master <laughs> in the scriptorium. But if I divide it up for you, and I just do that paleographer thing, like look at the G's. Can you see the differences? So despite these efforts at uniformity, um, and, and also maintaining an aesthetic of that certain script, there, there are little differences in there. So the differences in script and the use of scripts applied to different genres of writing were part of the commercial aspects of selling your work uh, as a scribe in the late medieval period. So this is an advertisement, uh, a sheet displaying different scripts. Scripts were based on the time it took to do them. So cursive goes faster, the, the, the very jobby Gothic ones take longer, level of difficulty, how big your light writing is for those big Gothic rotunda choir books. Um, and Gothic scripts alone had like their own hierarchy of pricing, like this one's more expensive than this one. So it was in the university towns, like something that really became like a commercial quantifiable thing. And there was a great flourishing of penmanship beginning in the 16th century as literacy rates grew and the printed books flooded the market. So you, you've got more books in the market, you've got more people reading, higher literacy rates, and um, think books are more affordable. And you get these DIY handwriting books, sample books that were all the rage. So I see these across everywhere. The Newberry Library has one of the largest collections in the world of these in Chicago. And what I loved, I was there last summer for a research fellowship, and they know I study nuns. And so the handwriting people were looking at all these handwriting books one day, and they were like, oh my god, this one says it's a sample book. It's the sample book of Sister Camilla Mancini. Like, it's a nun. She made her own handwriting sample book. So it's like this secular rage, you know, uh, fashion thing coming into the... Um, the convent, which I just totally loved. And she even says, I looked through it and I was like, oh my gosh, this is too funny. She says, this is the lettera cancelleresca più facile per le monache. This is the chancery cursive that's easiest for nuns. But it looks exactly like the regular chancery cursive. So I don't know, is she like selling? Is she like trying to market this to her fellow nuns or something? Uh, I just thought it was so funny. Um, so we get these handwriting sample books, and which does give us a sense, you know, if people are doing it for pleasure, what things are aesthetically pleasing for them. Um, the scribes themselves often do not report this ease of writing a script, but instead the difficulty of working in the scriptorium. So we get a note from 12th century Moravian scribe, Hildebert, drawn in the margins of the work he was copying, De Civitate Dei, Augustine's City of God, Hildebert is a secular scribe. You can tell that by his 
his outfit, and also he's, he's, he's in another book dressed in secular clothing, layman's clothing. His um, very loyal apprentice, Everwinis, sits here, and you can tell he's doing border work, which is like the bread and butter of those poor apprentice boys. They're just like, do more borders, do more initials, blah, 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 just forever until you can finally do something yourself. So uh, I love that he's, he's, part of the, he's part of the picture. But Hildebertus is very upset. He raises his hand in the air to throw the sanding cake at this awful little mouse or rat. So this thing in his hand is actually, I, what I've identified as a codicologist is the thing that if you made an error, you would just like sand off the parchment because it was erasable. And those things are made of flour and like ground glass and stuff. So it was like medieval sandpaper. And he's going to throw it at the mouse, um, the mensa of Hildeberti on his table. And because he's eating his bread, basically you can see him eating his lunch there. And the, the translation of, from the Latin says, most wicked mouse, you incite me to anger once too often. May God destroy you. And he's going to like throw the sanding cake at the mouse. So he's just like, it's hard. It's hard work. I mean, it's hard work to do the writing. And then you've got these damn mice <laughs> running around eating your food. Um, other in threats included, uh, well, the devil. So there's Titibulus, the book demon, who was specifically cited in many texts as the, the devil that comes, is a specific aspect of the devil that comes and makes you make scribal errors. So you're writing long, you're minding your own business, and then this demon comes and is like, nope, it's not that word, it's this one. Ah! You know, so we see him in other, in other manuscripts. This is the best one, though, I like it, because he's just so unassuming. You know, he's just like doing his own thing. We also get this general trope a lot, like the struggle of the scribe to complete the copying of a lengthy work, writing uh, certain scribes, and it's always in Gothic script. I'm sorry, just as a point. No humanist scribe is ever like, this took so long to write, and it was so hard. It's always a Gothic script. Um, because one who does not know how to write thinks it no labor. I will describe it for you. If you want to know how great it is the burden of writing, it mists the eyes, it curves the back, it breaks the belly and the ribs, it fills the kidneys with pain and the body with all kinds of suffering. Therefore, turn the pages slowly, reader, and keep your fingers well away from the pages. For just as a hailstorm ruins the fecundity of the soil, so the sloppy reader destroys both book and the writing. And for as the last port is sweet to the sailor, so the last line is to the scribe. So you get all this great, these colophons, these notes at the end of manuscripts. Or you get simply, now I've written the whole thing, for Christ's sake, give me a drink. You get those <laughs> translations as well. And I also see a lot of notes from my Italian nun scribes. Again, always writing in, in Gothic script. Um, more along the lines of piety. So this is her colophon. It's often in red to set off from the, blue, the black. So this is Suor Cleofe. She's from the Santa Brigida al Paradiso in Florence, which is a, a very, was a very prolific convent in Florence in the Renaissance period. And she records this note at the end of her copy of Bridget of Sweden's Revelations from 1490s. This work was written with much struggle and difficulty, she says. It's scritto con gran fatica e disagio, la maggior parte di notte al lume di lecerna. She says it was written with, with this great effort. It's scritto con disagio, fatica e disagio. And she tells us it's written by the light of a lamp. Like that's, that's how hard it was. It was, you know, you're working in these hours as you, as you can in the scriptorium. And this one's actually done as a devotional act in between her early morning hours. So she's only doing like little bits of it at a time. So uh, to close out, I'd like to turn to something that might appeal or make more sense to uh, the, the scientists in the room. Uh, this new technique's being applied to the science of paleography. So methodology is drawn for the quantitative sciences. The quantitative codicology has been around for forever. I'm a quantitative codicologist. That means like a bunch of data run the numbers, look at patterns, things like that. Um, and the quantitative study of material aspects of books, including scribal work. With the digital spreadsheets and methods of analysis, this work goes a lot faster in the 21st century than it did you know, in the mid-20th in the mid century. But one of the foremost uh, medieval books scholars using this methodology 
which he's called quantitative paleography, and, 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 and I, I'm going with it, it's, it's true, uh, is Eric Quackle. So this is his article that talks about this, Biting, Kissing, and the Treatment of Feet. Um, his 2012 study, which attempts to use quantitative analysis of scripts to identify, like, when did the Gothic script actually start? There's a lot of scholarly debate about this. So he's like, no, let's just apply science, people, okay? And really use those paleographical tools in the toolbox to think about when letters start kissing each other, coming together like this, and when they're biting. So this is a D and an E and then the same D and E. So like when does that happen here? Also looking at the angularity of script, so trying to kind of take what paleographers have always, are always done which, and then make it quantifiable and then, and then study it. And, and that's been very successful. So this study uh, looks at this gradual, the emergence of the touching of letters and tries to you know, pinpoint when the Gothic sort of emerged. And I really think that uh, Rutherford Aris would have been delighted at this scientific approach taken in this quantitative uh, analysis of the script. Paleography is, after all, a science, the study of ancient handwriting, and it's been approached as a science really since its inception. So the systematic analysis of characteristics of letter forms, the categorization and characteristics into historical arc, these techniques provide a framework for understanding when and where a particular example of writing took place. Scientific methodology provides a framework, but it's always relied on the keen eye and astute and long-term memory of paleographers, which I would say is true of scientists too, uh, of any scientist, uh, to identify traits unique to a particular place and time and to individual scribes. But even with the scientific analysis of script, our experience of beauty and looking at handwriting is subjective, again, drawn from our experience, knowledge, and particular aesthetic tastes. Thank you.